Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. In just a few seconds, I'll return with my guests, Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg. And we're going to talk about the significance or legacy of the life of Gorbachev. <laughs> On Tuesday, August 30th, Mikhail Gorbachev died, and his legacy is a matter of, of course, international discussion, debate. Apparently, Putin is not going to his funeral, which I believe is taking place uh, maybe as we speak. Uh, he wrote some kind of note about it. Uh, but Gorbachev has been praised in the West as a, as a hero of the deconstruction of the Soviet Union and also condemned and, and much talk about his failings. Now to talk about the significance or of Gorbachev's life and uh, the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, joining me again is Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you very much for joining me again, gentlemen. Thank you. Hey. Noam, why, why don't you, Noam, kick us off. Uh, you know, how do you assess the, the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union and the role of Gorbachev? Well, Gorbachev was not committed to the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, that's a misstatement. He, it's commonly said, but that was not his goal. He did open up Russia and he opened up the region to uh, a degree of uh, freedom that they had not enjoyed. His own intention was not to break up the Soviet Union, but he had a very much broader vision. And uh, I think that's his major contribution among many. He called for what he called a common European home from Lisbon to Vladivostok with no military alliances, uh, no victors, no defeated co-equals, working together towards uh, basically a social democratic future transformation and of the whole region uh, uh, working without military alliances with cooperation this was an expansion of the gaullist vision of, of an independent uh, europe as a third force in international affairs uh, gorbachev carried it forward um, could have survived. President Bush was not strongly opposed to it. Uh, Clinton dismantled it when he moved right away to uh, expand NATO to the uh, Russian border in violation of firm promises to Gorbachev. But the ideal of a common European home, no military alliances, working together to achieve a social democratic future. And that's a vision we should uh, honor, respect, and try to achieve. I saw Gorbachev when he was in power as the single head of state we'd ever seen, and really the last one we'd seen, I'd say, who was wholly committed, fundamentally committed, to a non-nuclear world, to getting rid of nuclear weapons, and beyond that, to a world with a different world order that was not based on threats and unilateral uh, sovereign uh, efforts to assure the security of one nation at the expense of another. But he pressed uh, an idea, a revolutionary idea, really, uh, that had some adherence in which he got from, uh, from some others of common security, sometimes called cooperative security, collective security. The idea was uh, first proposed in some detail by Olaf Palme in the Palme Commission in 1982, before Gorbachev came to power. But Gorbachev picked that up in and, and from European uh, anti-nuclear and anti-war activists like Horst Affeldt, and uh, in the US from Randy Forsberg and others who spoke of the need to take into account the security of others as well as one's own security. And let's try to avoid an action-reaction cycle in which efforts to maintain one's own security 
by threatening the other, by lessening the security of adversaries or rivals. And rather than having adversaries and rivals, work together to achieve security that would be best for both sides. In particular, Horst Schaffold and the others, and Randy Horsberg pressed uh, for non-offensive defense, um, uh, weapons of uh, uh, protection, which could not be used in offense, you had to sort of eliminate the offensive threat to the others. Uh, let me give an example that is relevant right now, for example. Uh, oddly, or in, in, an, in, in an unprecedented kind of relationship we have to Taiwan, uh, in theory, we agree with China, uh, Beijing, that uh, Taiwan is part of China, one China. On the other hand, thanks to pressure from Congress since 1979, we continue to arm this province of China, Taiwan, against a possible use of force against it. Now, if 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 she or his predecessors were like Gorbachev, they would not be threatening force to reunite with this province. Uh, actually, the way the as as Paul has said, it was not Gorbachev's intention to dismantle the Soviet Union, but he definitely refused to use force to maintain it in East Germany and other places in Poland, and it spread very quickly in, in 89, beyond what he'd expected. I think he thought there would be more willingness to remain in without the use of force. But in any case, he refused to use it. Okay, so uh, nevertheless, she and the others have always maintained that if peaceful means did not uh, were not sufficient to reunite eventually with Taiwan uh, and the mainland, that force was not excluded. And they have built up force to that effect for the last 20 years. Now, for the last 40 years, we have limited our sales of arms to Taiwan to so-called defensive means. And we've seen those means at work in uh, Ukraine, actually. Stingers, you know, anti-tank, anti-aircraft weapons that do not pose a threat beyond their borders. And actually, uh, very effectively, more than almost anyone expected in Ukraine. Uh, they have worked against the invasion by tanks and other offensive forces uh, in Ukraine, resulting so far in a stalemate, so not a wonderful situation. Well, in Taiwan, I believe the effort to move toward recognizing uh, Taiwan, overthrowing the 1979 agreements, uh, I, I really don't know entirely why they're out in the world uh, motivates those, but I think one thing is the cell, cell arms to uh, Taiwan to greatly increase above the levels of the past the sales of arms by our leading arms manufacturers, uh, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, Boeing, Lockheed. And uh, there has been talk even recently, of, let's add to their defense by giving them a deterrent capability against the mainland. And that would mean longer range weapons, missiles that could reach the mainland, which as far as I know, they don't have now. They did have when it was a US base before 1979. So the idea of making it a base, which would again threaten the mainland for deterrent purposes is clearly crossing a red line that would almost surely lead to war. Uh, so there is a difference between these armaments coming right back to Ukraine, as a matter of fact. What is the major rationale that uh, Putin has given for uh, forceful means to uh, prevent Ukraine from uniting with the West, not only in the European Union, but in NATO? And the answer that he gives is there could be NATO bases, which there aren't there now, which would have long range cruise missiles right on the border of Russia. Now, whether Russia could really withstand that or not, what we can predict is the old cycle. Hundreds of years, thousands of years, in effect, that when one part, when one region gains an offensive threat against the other, the other reacts in various ways by building up its own arms, or in this case, by invading by this. And uh, that threat of putting actual weapons. Now, right now, we've even given uh, long range rocket means to Ukraine with a proviso they must not use it against Russia, taking the risk that some will, someone will go beyond those green bounds and go into Russia. But the distinction is very clear there. So what Gorbachev accepted 
was the idea, this idea of non-offensive defense of removing a threat in order to regain to increase the security of both sides together. And he actually acted on that. By the way, I'm I'm very I remember this so clearly with the the death of Gorbachev and the fact that no one that I've seen in the obituaries has mentioned what Gorbachev, what he called the new way of thinking from Palmy and Forsberg and the others and and people in his own uh, group like uh, Georgi Arbatov and others at the Institute for Study of USA. And the new way of thinking included this notion of removing threats from your adversary. Well, on December 7th, 1988, uh, three years into his uh, becoming head of the Soviet Union, he gave a speech to the UN, totally unforeseen by the US, I would say, in which in the course, he talked about this common security and the need, need to work on common interests in pursuit, by the way, of what Noam has pointed to, a common home, uh, European home. And uh, to make it rather than, you know, a rival uh, adversaries confronting each other. He then said, unilaterally, he was removing 5,000 tanks from East Germany, which, by the way, had always surrounded Berlin and kept, you know, West Berlin uh, under threat during that whole time. So he's removing 5,000 tanks, 50,000 troops from East Germany. Ultimately, he took out half a million and half a million unilaterally before any other agreement from the armed forces he was producing. And as a colonel in the Pentagon was quoted in the New York Times the day after, the day after December 7th, he said, this is worse than Pearl Harbor, whether shockingly or not, but they meant that. As George A. Arbitoff said at the time, we are doing something terrible to you. We are removing your enemy. We're taking away your enemy. And that led, you know, that preceded the uh, the general reduction of, of force in East Germany that led to the uprisings. Well, I think what we've seen since then, uh, and right up to the present, is that this otherwise un, un inexplicable refusal of uh, the U.S. and NATO in the 90s and later in this century to try to enhance our friendly relation with Russia which was for a time not con well, it's not communist and was capitalist, uh, friendly, open for investment and whatever, to do what Gorbachev was offering, a friendly relationship. He said, not an adversary, friendly relationship. I think what that, and that's what George Kennan, one of the creators of the Cold War, said at the time, that expanding NATO was a disaster precisely because it would undermine those elements like Gorbachev in Russia and after Gorbachev, that were for an open, democratic, friendly relation with Europe in favor of reactionary and militaristic government. And Kennan said as early as 1990s, ultimately you'll go to Ukraine and that will seal it. You know, that will make, make impossible any friendly relationship uh, with, with Russia in this European home. Well, we acted totally contrary to that. As, as early as 2008, George W. Bush, against France and Germany's strong objection, said Georgia and Ukraine, both parts of the U.S. itself, will be part of NATO. And we've gone along those lines. Why were we doing that? Let me give my guess at this point that the ruling establishment in this country and the military industrial complex, the Atlanticist uh, forces, of NATO, which was our foothold in Europe, economically and militarily, never wanted a friendly relation with Russia uh, to persist, to be a non-enemy. Where would NATO be under those circumstances? Gorbachev and even Yeltsin and even Putin at one point said, well, maybe Russia could be in NATO. And for a while there was a partnership relationship. But why do you need NATO then if Russia's in it? Why do you need all these weapons that the corporations I've just described and French and other uh, corporations are selling to NATO against who? Uh, if, if Russia is a friend, uh, you, don't, you don't need any of this. So the profits go, but even more importantly, the US hege hegemonic leadership role in Europe 
vanishes if you don't have a Russian enemy. So contrary to Gorbachev, in other words, a Russian enemy was indispensable to our imperial elements here who wanted a, a dominant US position in NATO and elsewhere. And this concept of his pretty much vanished uh, with him. You just don't read about it. My friend Tom Reifer, our friend Noam, uh, sent me today at my request a number of articles on this subject, uh, which I've been looking at, which are absolutely fascinating by Randy Forsberg, John Steinbrunner, uh, Bjorn uh, Miller, who had innovated these concepts. They're very brilliant. In the early, even in the early 2000s. But they've gone down the memory hole, essentially. And I think that some US elements here have been successful in getting Putin to reconstitute Russia as a clear-cut enemy to the, un, as long as you can foresee now, enormous profitable benefit to the military industrial complex, but in particular to the US role in Europe. For example, getting rid of the Nord Stream 2 gas, gas line from Russia, which he was in opposed for decades now, for more than decades. So the loss of Gorbachev, not by death, uh, but much earlier, the power, um, I think, was, was the loss of these concepts to the world. I don't want to say irretrievable, but irretrievably, but I think uh, definitely lessened the odds for human survival. Noam, you want to pick up from there? There are a number of points that Dan made that I think ought to be stressed. Uh, the main one that comes out of what he's saying is that the great powers, United States, Russia, China, uh, must come to some kind of accommodation or else there's no hope for survival of the human species. Uh, notice I don't mention Europe, and that's interesting. Europe ought to be on a par with certainly China and the United States, at least economically. Uh, Russia doesn't even belong in that, uh, in that uh, club. Their economy is about the size of Mexico. Uh, Europe has failed in the last 70 years to find a place in the world order. It's got a huge economy, educated population, culturally advanced, uh, every reason why it should play a major role in world affairs. Well, there has been a conflict. One was the Gaullist vision as Dan pointed out, Olaf Palma uh, supported it. Uh, Willy Brandt in Germany with his us politik supported it. The idea that uh, there should be a third force in which Western Europe and Russia would join together without military alliances, that was confronted with the Atlanticist vision, as it was called, based on NATO, with the US in charge. Well, given US power, that of course won. When Gorbachev came along, it raised a new crucial issue. There was no, you could no longer rely on the pretext that we have to defend ourselves against the Russian hordes. Actually, it was always a pretext as Kennan and others understood well, but you couldn't even claim it anymore by the time that Gorbachev came along. So what was going to happen to Europe? Well, there's Gorbachev's conception of a common U European home, no military bases, co-equals, partnership, uh, uh, move towards general accommodation, which would then naturally extend to the China-based region. Uh, the road initiative came later and so on and so forth. That's one. The other was the Atlanticist vision, NATO-based, US in charge, NATO expanding to the Russian border. Uh, uh, the, uh, when George Bush II, not the first, 
uh, invited Ukraine into NATO. I don't know if he understood what he was doing, but the people around him certainly did. Uh, Robert Gates, his hawkish defense secretary, said this is reckless, provocative, crazy. If uh, Russia, if Ukraine was to go into NATO, any Russian leader would probably go to war. That's the hawkish secretary of defense. It was understood all along the line. Bush went ahead. Uh, France and Germany, as Dan pointed out, vetoed it, but US powers strong enough to overcome that, so it stays on the agenda. Since then, the US has been building up uh, Ukraine as an offensive, a partner that was integrated into NATO. In fact, US military journals call it a de facto member of NATO. Uh, the US has announced clearly it would not consider any Russian security concerns. Uh, we go on to the situation where we are now, where the at, 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 where NATO has changed the global geography. By now, NATO, the North Atlantic includes the Indo-Pacific region. The last NATO summit, for the first time, invited US Asian allies and explained that the realm of NATO includes now the Indo-Pacific region surrounding China, uh, conflict with Russia. This is a recipe for disaster. The world can't go on like then. We will have to quickly find a way to bring, first of all, for Europe to play the role it should in your world affairs, not hanging on to US coattails. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is about the only statesman visible in the world right now who's continuing his effort so far in vain to work towards some sort of way of ending the horrors in Ukraine through a diplomatic settlement and moving on towards better relations. That has to be done. If that isn't done, we, we have no hope. It's not only uh, Ukraine. They decide the kind of collateral damage, as it's called, is immense. It means uh, millions of people are facing starvation with the uh, uh, closing off of the Black Sea food and fertilizer region. Uh, they were the limited efforts to deal with the enormous crisis of global warming have been reversed. We don't have much time to spend the few years that we have, instead of dealing with this crisis, to exacerbating it, is beyond lunacy. There is a severe and growing threat of nuclear war. Uh, it goes way beyond Ukraine. Answer, we have to find ways to move towards Gorbachev's vision, to cooperate, work together, to overcome problems that have, have no borders. There are global problems. Nuclear war has no borders. Uh, climate change, of course, has none. Threats of growing pandemics have none. We cannot waste time destroying each other, uh, uh, producing destructive weapons and uh, carrying out mass slaughter when we must be working towards uh, quickly towards accommodation, diplomatic settlement, best of all, move towards the vision that Gorbachev sketched. All right, well, thank you both very much. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna continue my conversation uh, with Noam and Dan. We're gonna talk about US domestic politics and the rise of the far right and fascism in the United States. So join me for that. And oh, I, I'll, let me add one other thing. And please don't forget that we depend on your donations if you to do this. So you click the donate button, uh, get on our email list. If you're on YouTube, subscribe. And uh, thanks, thanks again for joining us on the analysis. Mm -hmm.